This is a puppy. It has a very cute face. It's easy for the human mind to understand intuitively where the puppy face starts and where it ends. However, to train a deep learning model to detect the puppy's face, we must be more explicit about where it is. For instance, we might label the area corresponding to the puppy face with the bounding box. If we want to train a deep learning model to detect this class of object, we will train it to come up with its own bounding box. The main hurdle with this method for detecting object is that we need to estimate if this prediction is good enough for our current class label. In this case, we can intuit with our brains that the model does understand a bit of what we mean by a puppy face, but it's not well said is this new prediction better now? Hmm, a bit hard to tell. One thing we can see is that the area of overlap seemed to be a bit bigger between the two bonding boxes, which is good. With this new prediction though, we get a better area of overlap between the ground truth and the prediction, but also a lot of erroneous area. Intuitively, this isn't too good. All of that region that is outside the ground truth, aka the false positive, should definitely be penalized in some way. We need to find a way to quantify the quality of the bonding boxes generated in order to assess how well our model is doing. So as to reward overlap and punish out of bound prediction. This is where the intersection over union similarity metric comes into play. In this video, we'll be covering the formula with a PyTorch implementation to help enrich the understanding. For those that are new to the channel, I'm Yassin, a published researcher and machine learning practitioner who love to teach. We'll go first through some definition of IOU, which had many names, then we'll break down the formula slowly and step by step understand the similarity metric in depth. Afterward, we'll quickly check what modification to the formula we need to enact to make use of IU for segmentation mask. You'll see this isn't too complicated. And finally, we'll go through some PyTorch code from the official documentation to tie all of it back together. Let's start with some definition for the intersection over union metric. IOU has many names because it's such a fundamental quantity for many fields. It is usually called the Jacquard Index in honor of Paul Jacquard, a professor of botany way back in 1901. Paul Jacquard actually called it coefficient de communauté in 1901. But also it was already in use as the ratio of verification by Grove called Gilbert, a geologist. That quantity was also rediscovered in another name by the mysterious Tanimoto in 1958 in an internal memo at IBM. Anyway, all this to say that the quantity is important for many uses and should be part of your toolbox for sure, even outside of object detection. For our purpose, we'll be thinking in bounding boxes where A is the ground truth and B is the prediction. The formula is basically the intersection of A and B divided by the union of A and B. Simple as that. If we unroll a bit the union, it can be rewritten as the area of the ground truth plus the area of the prediction minus the intersection of A and B. In order to calculate this quantity, we therefore need to find the area of the three surfaces, A, B, and the intersection of A and B, if any. The quantity is bounded between 0 and 1. If there is no overlap between the two bounding boxes, it's going to give us an IOU of 0, since the intersection of A and B has an area of 0. If we have a perfect match, we will effectively get the equivalent of A divided by 2A minus A, which is A divided by A, which is 1. Okay, let's now break down how we can go from bounding boxes to the IU formula with the tree area properly calculated. First, specifically for object detection, our grid should look somewhat like this with only positive coordinate point. Top left is our origin, 0, 0, and correspond to the top left of the picture. Top right, we have the x-axis being its maximum at the edge of the picture. At the bottom left, we have the y-axis being its maximum at the lower edge. And finally, at the bottom right, it's maxing the two axes. Now, to define a bounding box, we need only two coordinate points, since we're dealing only with rectangles. Top left and the bottom right which for the purpose of this tutorial we will name respectively x1, y1, and x2, y2. Therefore, a bounding box is written up as a tuple of four quantity, x1, y1, x2, y2. We'll see that nomenclature in the code, so keep that in mind to not get confused. We have the same definition for the prediction box, which has its own set of x1, y1, x2, y2. So in total, to calculate the areas we need for the IU formula, we need two set of four coordinates. With these four coordinates per box, we can then find easily the width and height of the box and multiply them together to get the area. The height is defined as y2 minus y1 in our definition, and the width is defined as x2 minus x1. 
The intersection is the crux of the formula because it requires checking the eight parameters in a specific way and account for the fact that sometimes there is no overlap. If you pay close attention to the region that is overlapping, it can also be defined as having a top left and bottom right coordinate, like a bounding box. Therefore, at the end of our calculation for the intersection, we should also get four coordinates that will be a mix of the eight we already have. Let's now see how to get these four coordinates. If there is an overlap, then the first point we should be getting is the top left, which has an X and a Y. To select the right X, we need to get the largest number between the X1 of the ground truth and the X1 of the prediction, which are a top left. In the example on the screen, the largest quantity is the X from the prediction as it's further to the right. Similarly, for Y, for the top left, it's going to be the maximum between the top left element for the ground truth versus the top left element for the prediction. In this example, it's again the Y from the prediction that is the largest. The intersection, top left, is x1 prediction and y1 prediction. For the bottom right point, it's the inverse. It's the minimum of the bottom right coordinates of the bounding boxes. In this example, it's the coordinate set of the ground truth that is the smallest. Therefore, the four coordinates for the current example is x1 pred, y1 pred, x2 ground truth, y2 ground truth. Let's shuffle the bounding box a bit to see how our four formula for the coordinate behave. For the first top left point of the intersection, the x is the one from the ground Truth. However, the Y is the one from the prediction, creating an hybrid between the two bounding boxes coordinate. Similarly, the bottom right X is the one from the prediction and the Y come from the ground truth. Therefore, we can get the coordinate of the intersection as X1 ground truth, Y1 prediction, X2 prediction, Y2 ground truth. By the way, for these type of formulas, don't hesitate to pause the video and take a good old pen and paper and walk through a few examples yourself. It will help vastly understand the intuition. Now, what happened with our four formula if there is no overlap? Let's walk through an example. We're going to get that the x1 for the intersection is the ground truth. The y1 is the prediction, which put our top left point really enough in the bottom left corner. That's a good indication that something will be off when we'll be calculating the area afterward. For x2, we get the x2 pred, which is the smallest, and y2 ground truth, which is the smallest, putting our bottom right at the top right. If we look at what is happening in this scenario, we have the width and height, both being negative quantity following our original formulation. What should we do logically in this case? If there is no overlap, what we actually need to do during our R calculation is to clamp the height and width value at zero. If they do become negative, it means that the top left and bottom right coordinate have flipped. This is our indicator that we are in a no overlap zone. Therefore, we can modify this formula from this to this and we should be good to go. Now you're asking yourself, why are we jamming this check in the area calculation and not when we are checking the top left and bottom right value? The reason for this is that it's much simpler to implement in code as we'll see in a minute and we can batch a lot of bounding box calculation without worrying more than necessary about performance. If one of the value for height and width is negative, it will directly set the whole area to zero so it will bring the IOU to a correct answer without tedious if checking. So if we recap for the different array we need to get for box one, the ground truth, we have the following formula, y2 minus y1 times x2 minus x1. Same thing for box two, which is the prediction. And finally, for the intersection we, area, we have the following, which we found the x1, y1, x2, y2 using our four formulas. Therefore, the fourth area to find, the union, can be composed using the three area we just found out. Coming back to our formula, we can directly plug each of these quantities in there. And voila, we're done. Okay, take a deep breath because the hard part is over. If you look at the segmentation mask, it's much easier to follow. Let's use this as an example. It's a somatic embryo from Pinus radiata, which is a type of tree. It's a beautiful tree. Anyway, as you can see from the image, the ground truth is the equivalent of our ground truth bounding box, but more freeform. Predicted mask is equivalent to our prediction bounding box, and the false negative is what is in the ground truth that the prediction mask isn't covering, and the false positive is where the prediction mask is covering, but shouldn't. The true positive is our enteric section in this example. As you can see, there is no bounding box here. We are only dealing with pixels. The masks are represented internally as a grid of pixels of zeros and one, where zero means the mask is not applied and one mean that the pixel is part of that mask. So we have two set of grid of zero and one here. With that being said, if we look at the three quantity we need to calculate the intersection over union, we have, we have the sum of pixel for the mask for the ground truth. We have the sum of pixel for the mask for the prediction. And finally, we have the sum of pixels that are both part of the ground truth and the prediction mask. For the two individual masks, it's actually quite easy to have the quantity. We just need to sum up all the pixel part of that mask. Since it's a binary mask, we will end up summing up a bunch of 
zeros, which are not part of the mask, and batch of one, top part of the mask. So effectively, the area will be the number of ones we have. The intersection is a bit more difficult, but you can look at it as multiplying the entry together, since they have the same exact size, and then summing up the matrix just like we did. So we intuitively take the product of each corresponding entry together, which will zero out everything in the metric that isn't a one on both matrix. Then we sum up the resulting intermediary matrix we get, like we did for the ground truth and prediction mask. Or, as we will see in the code, if we reshape our matrix into a vector directly, since the actual 2D structure isn't that important, and we take the dot product of the two vector, we are going to get the same scalar at the end in one go. All in all, way less logical checking when we're dealing with masks. All right, to wrap everything together, let's now jump into the PyTorch code walkthrough. I've taken the code from the official documentation of PyTorch for the bonding boxes, and the segmentation mask code come from the instance tracker library. Let's check it out. So here we are in the code. I uh, stole this uh, part of the code from the PyTorch documentation. It's on my GitHub, um, but the important part is uh, my walkthrough of the code. You can find this code on the PyTorch documentation. So there's a few things and this last part over here, the mask IOU is taken from uh, the instance tracker library. Let's break it down step by step. I have a nice readme that recaps uh, a bit all of the calls that we need to make in order to get this going with the actual PyTorch code. So you're going to see something that is um, currently in use. So we start with the box IOU, right? And uh, it takes two boxes, two set of box. Those are tensors. And uh, it's not just one box and not a box. It's a set of box and not a set of box so that we're gonna be able to do the comparison between N box over here and M box over here. If we have only one box and another one box, we're just gonna get one uh, value scalar out of it. You can see here it's a N by four and a N by four. Remember here the, uh, the value uh, on the four is the four coordinate so x1 y1 x2 and y2 okay so if we look at the code that is important we have the basically the following we have box enter union and then we give the two sets of boxes and you're going to get the intersection and the union and you do intersection divided by union so this is basically just like a, a very high level function the actual thing that we need to check out is this one so if you look at the inside box enter union, there's a bunch of different area here. So we take two sets of box, just like before. This is an internal function. And then we're gonna first calculate the area one and area two. And after that, we're gonna do the calculation for the intersection. And finally, we're gonna do the calculation for the union. So let's first jump into the box area function. You'll see it's pretty trivial. It's basically the formula for a rectangle. And what we're gonna do here is Basically, the, forget the upcast here, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be box at this parameter minus box at this parameter times box at the third one minus box at the first one here. So that's the thing. And if we just uh, map it to our uh, variable, we have exactly what we saw in the deck, x2 minus x1 times y2 minus y1. So this is the height, this is the width. So if we come back here, in the box enter union, we have we can replace this in our head to be that, and now we're left with this intersection part, which is the crux. Take a look over here at the LT and RB. So here, left top, right bottom, we have um, the max function and then the min function here. And if you see, we have the maximum between two quantity here and here for box one and for box two. So if you rewrite that, we get LF top x1 left top y1 equal max of x1 ground truth x1 prediction y1 ground truth y1 prediction what i'm doing here is i'm just unrolling this right, because there's two variables so it's as if you're duplicating this twice uh, but remember there's a whole bunch of them that we're doing at the same time same thing here we have right bottom x2 right bottom x1 equal the minimum version of this formula so then if we're over here with these unruled uh, value that we have, we are doing the right bottom minus the left top here. And then we're clamping. Forget the upcast here. And if we were to rewrite them, we're going to have this. We're going to have RBX2, uh, comma, RBY2 minus left top X1, comma, left top Y1, right? And then we clamp. And if we were, because this is a tuple, you're doing actually this minus this, and you're gonna do this minus that. If we're to rewrite it, we have the width and the height, this is what WH mean here, 
the width will be rb x2 so right bottom x2 minus left top x1 same thing here the height rb y2 minus left top y1 over here and then we clamp both of them and then with the width and height we're doing over here uh this one times this one if one of them is smaller than zero um then we're going to clamp it at zero and then this whole quantity the intersection will be zero if we recap what we did here is we selected with those four formula the right x1 from the prediction or the ground truth so the eight variable that we have we're going to permute here based on this setup and after that with this thing we're calculating the width and height in an optimized fashion and finally we're calculating the union as follow so union equal the area one that we calculated before plus the area two minus the intersection and then we're going to go back to the main function and we're going to do what we just saw before so nothing too crazy the more most important point is this part over here and this part over there right just if you unroll it a bit then it makes a lot more sense so let's take a look at the mask intersection over union and you're going to see it's way easier it's this part over there so this is the whole code we're going to go step by step so what we have here is a mask which which is number of masks that we have because we're going to do n times m here and then i have a width height and a width and it's a bunch of floats but it's like actually zeros and one it's a binary mask for both of them so and then we're going to output the n by m float which is between zero and one so this is our actual iou uh, number so first thing we're doing here with the mask is we're going to reshape them so that we actually have vector so it's going to be a vector of h time w so it's going to be one long vector but we have n and m of them and then the intersection here is the dot product of the two masks basically since now we have a bunch of vectors and a dot product of two vectors will be a bunch of scalar which will be literally the intersection and then for the area one and area two for each of the masks that are now a bunch of vectors we're going to sum up all of the numbers in there remember it's zero and one so basically you're summing up all of the one to have the area and finally the union here is the area one that we just calculated plus the area two that we just calculated minus the intersection and that's it there's a bit of uh, some funny thing happening here but basically uh, this is a where function so there's a condition here it's a logical condition that will return a boolean if it's true you're going to return that if it's false you're going to return this so if the union here is equal to zero we're going to return a bunch of zeros for this and if the end if not we're going to do the intersection divided by union but in all cases here intersection divided by union is the last thing we're doing that's it for today i hope you enjoyed the video don't forget to like if it was the case and leave a comment if you have any questions i'm here to help have a great week everyone and see you in the next video mm -hmm.